the store. And uh, Rhett makes lots of really good reading recommendations, FYI. He does. So we're turning I him into a book. Like book enough to actually be here tonight. He does. <laughs> yep. Are we live? Wonderful. Well, in that case, let me. <coughs> Excuse me, in that case, let me put this back. Welcome to our virtual audience, and thank you very much for coming out to see Dana and uh, the, for the publication Day of Theft of an Idol. What a shame, it was a rotten day. They don't have days like this in Egypt, do they? It rained in Alexandria when we were there. That's true. Not and hard, not like today, mm -hmm. not like here. There was no thunder and lightning. Okay. Well, anyway, um, this this series um, goes back. Well, Dana can tell you the origin story because I think it's interesting about why she decided she would like to write a book set in, or a series set in the time of Cleopatra. And it's important to remember with all of the King Tut stuff going on because this month is the 100th anniversary of the discovery of the tomb of King Tut by Lord Carnarvon, which is bad luck for him because he got a, a mosquito bite that got infected and he died. It wasn't a curse from the tomb. It was an actual bug. Um, and Howard Carter. Um, but Cleopatra is not part of that ancient. She's not part of the old pharaonic dynasty. She's actually Greek. And the Ptolemies uh, were a different dynasty. So take it away. Tell us about well, it. Well, I mean, you know, I used to babysit for Darlene Kashvirov in Seldovia, Alaska. And she had three kids, and she had a collection of Shakespeare plays on vinyl. And if you went back and looked at those records now, you'd recognize a lot of names that um, we all see on the big screen now, like Diana Rigg and Anthony Hopkins and like that, John Gielgud and stuff. One of the recordings she had was Antony and Cleopatra. And another, another one was Julius Caesar. <laughs> so I listened to all of them, of course, but that, that I think, probably is what, where, where it all started. And I was really fascinated in um, the story of Cleopatra from the beginning. And I never believed much of what I read about her. Um, it didn't, none of it seemed to make a lot of sense. And the fact of the matter is, everybody at that time writes about Julius Caesar and Caesar Augustus. They don't necessarily write about Cleopatra because she, you know, her story was suppressed. Her story was suborned because Octavian pretty much, well, I mean, Julius Caesar as well. They looted Alexandria to buy their way into power into Rome, both of them. Um, and so I just sort of had my eye out for stories about Cleopatra. And I saw an exhibit, which I cannot remember now where it was or which one it was, but the one moment was um, there was an exhibit on Cleopatra, and it was, I can't even remember when it was, but it was at the exact same time that Alaska Airlines started flying direct nonstop between Anchorage and Chicago. And this exhibit in one of three places in the world was going to be at the Heard Museum in Chicago. The Field Museum, the Field Museum excuse me, yes. The Heard Museum is here. Sorry about that. Um, and so I, you know, I thought, well, okay. And I asked a couple of friends of mine, okay, let's go. And they're friends who, you know, they'll pretty much go anywhere. So we went and we rented a place to stay and, um, went in and spent the whole day at this, um, exhibit. And it was phenomenal. It was, it stood the whole story of Cleopatra as anybody had ever written it before, right on its head. And of course, my ear was very receptive to that. So I still have the book. I've actually bought this gigantic book book with all of the um, illustrations and the story and everything. And um, then I was on the hunt. Then I was looking. I was really looking. And then finally, at some point, um, Stacey Schiff wrote uh, Cleopatra. And after that book, that was it. I thought, okay, I am going to write a series set in Alexandria in the time of Cleopatra, and everything happened from there. Don't ask me where I of Isis came from. I have no idea where I, I, I don't know, maybe it's because I worked in two different corporations and the head guy always has a hatchet man. <laughs> so I, I'm, you know, I think maybe I decided that Cleopatra had, ought to have a hatchet man, but because I am me, naturally it's going to be a hatchet woman, and so it is. Um, and it just took off from there. And I'm still researching it because every none of the historians agree on anything. They can't even decide what year she was born. And the the she was the secondary story at that time, you know. And then she was demonized after um, uh, Octavian, um, after the defeat at Actium. 
But there is that actually is better. The fact that less is known about her is better for the writer of um, fiction because I can fill in lots of spaces <laughs> with whatever I want because there's nobody to tell me any different, <laughs> which I intend to do. <laughs> no, I mean it's really true that um, that it is the, the genealogy of many of these rulers is extremely murky, um, and there was a lot of you know when they called people like brother and sister were they really were they half brothers and sisters you know were they weirdly cousins so cleopatra's mom is mother is not named right you know everybody assumes it was cleopatra six and alivi's wife uh ptolemy uh, 12's wife cleopatra's dad but they don't know for sure it's not named so and she it could be had, anybody I wanted to be. Yep, she <laughs> may have had mixed blood, you know. I mean, she wasn't necessarily in the pure. Do you all know Ptolemy was one of Alexander's generals, and when Alexander the Great died, they split up his empire, and Ptolemy got Egypt. Um, and Ptolemy when, took Egypt, I well, think. It was the biggest prize in the Alexandrian Empire, and I think he just went. And also, there is a possibility, Barbara, that Ptolemy was, um, the first Ptolemy was Alexander's bastard brother. That his father was Philip of Macedon. That I have seen. Surprised me. There were I, bastards yeah. all over the place, yeah. you know, in those days, literal and physical. Um, but but you know, one of the things that Dana and I, because we we went to Egypt together to do some research. Um, did you all see the the photos I sent you of you know? I can't believe we actually crawled down into that tomb. You know what? Climbing out wasn't hard, but going down face first down that shaft that was really scary. Yeah. But anyway, um, they have never found Alexander's tomb. They have never found Cleopatra's tomb. And only recently there's some speculation they might finally have found Nefertiti's tomb. And I don't know. I sent a link to you. There's a British archaeologist that thinks that King Tut's tomb is actually an antechamber because he died so suddenly and it's not a real tomb that Behind it may be, in fact, a bigger tomb, a real tomb that is undiscovered, and it could be Nefertiti's tomb. So LIDAR, some of these new, you know, techniques may um, may reveal. What did I read today in something that said like something like only 30% of what's buried in Egypt from pharaonic times has been discovered. There is an enormous amount out there that is still... Um, so Dana and I are hoping that Cleopatra's tomb will be discovered. It's hard It'd to be imagine so cool there if isn't we could find her mummy, because they can look at it and they can determine how she died, and they could maybe put that possibly maybe put that and to her rest. Genealogy, yeah. you know, they could work out a lot of things. You, you're never a hundred percent. Do we know a hundred percent that they would have mummied, mummified her and buried her? Is it even possible there is no tomb? I have to say, I would prefer that, in fact, if she's not found until I stop writing these books. <laughs> no, so. no, but I mean, I think it's an assumption we're making that could, in fact, be, be false uh, because of the way she died, the circumstances and so forth. It may be, you know, that they dropped her into an unnamed grave or threw her into the Mediterranean or something. It's not entirely clear. But Alexander, I'm pretty sure, has a tomb somewhere. And, you know, it's like um, Genghis Khan. They've never been able to discover where he's buried somewhere out there well, in the state. Alexander's supposed Mongolia. to be buried in Alexandria. Yeah. And they just they just haven't found it yet. It's probably underwater, Barbara. Well, yeah. I was going to say because so much of it. I was at the British Museum and they uh, some years ago and they did a fabulous exhibit um, underwater photography about the parts of Alexandria that have actually fallen into the Mediterranean and they've gone down and done underwater archaeology and the whole bit. And you're right, it's very possible that that where he's buried is now somewhere in the water and you know, that's why they're the not coolest find thing it. we saw was the Great Library of Alexandria, because they built a new one. And they have a statue of Ptolemy, the first Ptolemy Soder one, um, in front, uh, on the corner of the museum, and it's one that they get dredged up out of the harbor of Al Alexandria. They're down there right now, you know, finding more stuff. There's a documentary uh, I, I watched on it. Is that the one I sent you from Viking? No, it was a different one. All right, well, yeah. Viking Cruise Lines has got a new Egyptian ship. I mean, you know, they talk about Nile River cruises. I mentioned this the other day when Tosh Alexander was here. You can't actually sail down the Nile. You can only go from uh, Luxor to Aswan, which is like a day and a half. But otherwise, they fly you because they closed the banks of the Nile because they couldn't guarantee the safety of boats on the water because there are all kinds of 
you know, remember there was a whole boatload of Germans or something that got kidnapped or shot, or whatever. So I don't know why, you know, ideally you could start in Alexandria and go all the way to Aswan, where, of course, the river actually is so dammed that what you've got below it is Lake Nasser. There, the Nile disappears into Lake Nasser all the way down below Abu Simbel, and then it, it goes back, and the dam in Ethiopia will probably change the Nile even more. We don't have that's all going. But anyway, Viking has put in a new ship, and they sent out four videos, and one of them includes High Clear Abbey, which is Downton Abbey, and uh, Lord Carnarvon, the, the current Lord Carnarvon, because it was his grandfather that, you know, died in Egypt, um, brought back all kinds of stuff from Egypt. So there's a whole kind of replica in, in High Clear Abbey of one of the tombs and other stuff. So I think we're having a big Egyptian moment because of the 100th anniversary. I said to Dana, well-timed. <laughs> I wish I could say I meant to do that. <laughs> Right. So, Tita Sherry, where does she come from? Um, what do you mean, where does she come from? The character? I just said, I have no idea. Out of the ether, she sprung forth from my brow. Like Venus Athena from the head of Zeus. Her. Oh, no. I mean, the the, the, um, you know, I mean, I write crime fiction. And um, I, when, if you're going to be writing in Alexandria in the time of Cleopatra, you got to give Alexandria a role, uh, Cleopatra a role. You have to. So um, the best way to do that is someone who has known Cleopatra her entire lifetime. Someone, maybe the one person that she does trust um, so that you can see the inner workings of the state along with the individual cases that Ted Asheri, um does. And that just comes from years and years of reading crime fiction. That That's just practice. <laughs> that's <laughs> So when we first meet it, Sherry in the first book, her predecessor in the role of Eye of Isis has been foully murdered. Ooh. So Teddy, Teddy Sherry, Sherry as you call her, is drafted by Cleopatra. She was not a volunteer for the job. No, she had to be strong-armed into it. And the entire investigation is basically Cleopatra testing her to see if Teddy Sherry can do the job. And in fact, she figures it out, and she can. And in the meanwhile, Cleopatra has enacted, and I wanted to be very clear that Cleopatra is an extremely ruthless character, which is why I ended that book the way that I did. And the, that it's a reminder to Teta Sherry as well of who her friend is. She is also the queen of Egypt. Yeah, and queens can't go soft. No. Right. So Cleopatra's personal life before Julius Caesar was pretty complicated. Um, she was married off to what? One of her, quote, brothers, but, you know, we're not entirely clear. Well, her father named her um, his heir right. and then married her to, I think it's the Ptolemy 11. No, uh, sorry, Ptolemy 13. And he's the one who decided it would be a good idea to swim the Nile in a full suit of armor and drowned. And that was the, pretty much the end of the Battle of Alexandria. And then Julius Caesar, because things were so fraught back in Rome, nobody, the, not nobody, he had his adherents, but he also had people who hated him, and they were afraid that they were, he was going to make himself king, which, of course, is exactly what he was going to do. And they did not want him attaching, acquiring um, Egypt and Alexandria as his own personal fiefdom. So he was determined that he was going to set things up so that it looked like Egypt was still Egypt. I mean, it was still a client state of Rome, but it was still ruled by the hereditary king and queen. So I think he probably, I mean, we don't know for sure, forced uh, Cleopatra into um, uh, marrying the next Ptolemy. I think it was either her second or her third brother who was named Ptolemy. I think one of them died before that. Um, and um, but there was no question who was the power, um, none whatsoever. And at that time, Egypt was the breadbasket of Rome. It was that, you know, because of the Nile inundation, it was incredibly fertile land, and Rome already had a supply chain problem, <laughs> sort of like today. But, you know, there it was a big deal for them to import their grain and so forth. They, it was, it'd be 100, 100 or 150 years before Rome could feed itself. So they relied on Egyptian grain. Roman soldiers marched on Egyptian grain. Yeah. So anyway, Rome was a was a key province. And, you know, it's, it's another one of those deals where there are all kinds of theories of history. One of them is the great man theory of history. You know, does one individual have the power to really change things? You can think about Napoleon. You can think about Hitler. Currently, you think about Donald Trump, but try not to. Um, and 
if what would have happened if the Battle of Actium went the other way? Octavian would not have managed to make himself Caesar Augustus. Uh, you know, it would have been a, a completely different world. That one battle was so decisive. And then, of course, as Dana said, history is always written by the winners. Shakespeare was particularly bad about that. Shakespeare always wrote about the winners, didn't he? Mm -hmm. yeah. And in this case as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Um, but Antony is just an execrable human being. I mean, that the, 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 I think the guy had maybe one good battle in him. And he was a, he was a womanizer and a drunkard. And um, he was the very personification of Dionysus on Earth. And um, it's not, I mean, the, the at Actium, his people kept defecting to Octavian's side. <laughs> they kept sneaking across, going across. I mean, they had very, very, they had very little to fight with other than uh, Cleopatra's troops when the time came to actually fight. Nobody so wanted to not, fight for Anthony. You're not there in the series, but you do have to ask yourself, you know, uh, why did Cleopatra take up with Anthony? And I think she'd oh. run out of choices. The, 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 the Octavian and Antony divided up the Mediterranean between them. I mean, there was Lepidus too, but he was kind of a non-entity. He was a yes guy. So, and Antony got the eastern part of the Mediterranean. I mean, what was she going to do? She, you know, she, Egypt was still a client state of Rome. She, you know, she was, and it worked once to attach herself to the Roman leader. Maybe it would work twice. And in fact, it did work for a good long time. But we're not there yet in the series. No, I'm not writing right. about that part yet. We are not. And maybe never. Well, one of the great things about writing historical fiction is that everybody's dead. So you don't have to age your characters in real time. You can write stories that start like the day after, you know, the last one. Remember Lindsay Davis, her second book? She wrote... Um, I'm trying to remember, The Silver Pigs, and then Shadows and Bronze started literally within, an, I think it was an hour or the next morning of the conclusion of The Silver Pigs, you know, and why not? Because one of the things that when I started actually looking at the life of Cleopatra was how long she was in power. You know, I mean, she lived uh, for that time a pretty long time, and she was the queen for a pretty long time, and there's so little known about her. There may be one scrap of paper with her handwriting on it, extant to this day. There's only a couple of places, we saw one of them, where you can see her cartouche um, that are actually, that have survived into the present day. Um, and there, that's, so there's a lot of blank spaces in their life. I mean, it's just crying out for somebody to come fill them up. <laughs> Why not indeed? So when you designed, or sp she sprang from your head or whatever it was, <laughs> Sherry, um, talk about some of the other characters because you've populated this series already with several key players. Well, I'm all about the ensemble cast. I mean, the K2X series has a large ensemble cast. Liam Campbell's series, I mean, Silk and Song had a huge ensemble cast. Um, I really do believe that um, the supporting cast is what makes a book. It's not necessarily, you got to have a good for main character as well. But there's other people that you want to know how they're doing from book to book to book. So um, uh, Teddy Sherry has a pretty fraught personal backstory, as many women did in that day, even in Alexandria, where they had um, way more rights than, say, the ladies across the bay in Rome. Um, but... Um, the the I'm sorry. What was the question? <laughs> what was it that you? I, I wanted you to name some of the no, some other of the characters. Uh, sorry, and yeah. Tell us about sorry, I keep going back to Teddy Sherry. Um, yeah. Um, the the I was really interested to find out that Apollodorus, who's the guy who allegedly wrapped Cleopatra into a carpet and carried her into Caesar. That's the myth, right? That's the only mention of him in the record. The only mention, and they say he was a Sicilian. Like it's the Apollodorus, the Sicilian is the way they were, the way that fragment is um, referred to. And I thought, you know, the queen of Egypt, Alexandria and Egypt, because they were two separate places. They're two disparate places. And when she was queen, she was queen of Alexandria and of Egypt. And the, she wouldn't just trust herself to be, you know, smuggled in to see the leading Roman, the guy who has the power of life or death over her and her reign. She's not going to let just anybody do that. It's got to be somebody she trusts. So the idea of a personal guard was born out of that notion.
And then, of course, I love the idea of bringing your father into it, who is really one of the most feckless people. <laughs> um, Lord, um, you read about you get whiplash reading about his reign. Um, but I, everybody, you know, no one is only one thing. And I thought he could be really smart about the kid who should succeed him. And he would guard that child. And that was where um, Apollodorus came from. I don't like to give away too much about well, Apollodorus. No, no, he's yeah. developing. But yeah. and talk about Teta Sherry's uncle in her oh, family. Uncle Neb. Uh, Teta Sherry is married off against her will at a very young age by her social climbing mother. And um, the marriage does not end well. And Teta Sherry runs for it to Uncle Neb. And Uncle Neb is this big, boisterous, you know, big bellied, big voiced guy who has been all over the world and um, been to Nut, which at that time was what they called India, and I mean, just been everywhere. And um, she, he takes her into partnership because he doesn't have any children of his own. I haven't explored that yet at all. Um, and takes her into partnership as his partner because women in that day and time, in that place, in Alexandria, they could hold down jobs, they could own businesses, they could marry, they could divorce, they could get alimony, they could keep custody of the kids, they could hold jobs, they could do they professions. I saw a... Um, a um, hieroglyphic in one of my reference works. There's a woman on a flat boat right next to a larger boat on the Nile River, and she's selling cones of sugar to the people up on the deck, all by herself. I just, I, you know, I mean, that's emblematic. You know, if they, if they were, and you know, that was. It's extraordinary in that time and place that women had that many rights, and that's another fascinating thing about Alexandria. Yeah, Alexandria was really an enlightened city for its time, no question about it. The citizens and the women. So basically, Chetasheri is part of a trading company, a trading empire. Of course, when you say he'd been everywhere, he's just been everywhere in the known world, which wasn't all that big, but it went, you know, probably all the way to um, the Straits of Gibraltar and down around to India, you know, are you going to send him as far as China? It was no, China was known. I mean, they were importing silk from China. So you could. The, yeah, you could. But here's the thing. Um, the Chinese, I just read recently, the Chinese tried many times to reach out to Rome directly to form some kind of a trading partnership, but they were stymied by the Parthians, what were referred to as the Parthians, basically everybody in the middle in between Rome and China at that time, um, because yeah. the, they didn't want to lose the dues from the Silk Road. That was a, that was a moneymaker for them. They didn't want to, in, you know, encourage any kind of closer relationship between Rome and uh, right. Roman traders and Chinese traders. Forget it, or m Middle Sea yeah. traders and Chinese traders. And so, you know, ships could go distances, but they didn't have navigation instruments the whole bit. Latitude and longitude were not a familiar concept. So there, are, there's a um, port. And there, it's not really a port anymore, I don't think. I'm not even sure there's a town there. It's called Berenike, and it's on the Red Sea, on the right. Egyptian side of the Red Sea. And they're excavating there, and they're finding all kinds of stuff from all these various other, all these places, including China. You know, they imported, um, um, that was another thing that was, I found was fascinating. They imported spices, cinnamon, pepper in particular. Um, Romans like their food spicy. And they, they um, pepper was called curry at the time. Yeah. <laughs> and they would, and it would be, there was, oh, what was that? I wonder if I can remember. Um, there was a comparison by that, you know, one keg of uh, pepper could, like, was equal to the value of the boat that it sailed on and everything else that was in it. I mean, it was some phenomenal amount like that. And it was just, it was... Yeah, I mean, that was true in Tudor England. I mean, that's why we had the yeah. Dutch East India Company the and all the rest of it. You know, people were... I mean, food wasn't refrigerated, meat went off, you know, whatever it is, and spices were a huge deal. But they were also thought to have medicinal properties and probably, you know, longevity problem, I mean, all kinds of things. But, you know, really amazing stuff. Now, you know, so we can go to Costco, right? We can get anything we want. That whole that whole idea of special stuff that you had to go to a certain part of the world to acquire, long gone. Anyway, so Teta Sherry has money. I mean, she kind you know she's working with her uncle Nim. She has um, you know a career going on. Uh, she's divorced the feckless husband, and um, so you know taking up this job for Cleopatra is not necessarily a great thing for her. No, she doesn't necessarily. She's got a day job. She doesn't necessarily need to be doing this. But when the Queen of Egypt says to Queen of Alexandria and Egypt says to you, will you do this for me? I mean, you don't say no either. No, I mean. Right. So this is her third investigation as chronicled by Dina. And um, 
you will get this beautiful book, isn't it? Theft of an Idol. I love the presentation. That um, there must be a certain amount of like tomb robbing or other sort of robbery in effect. So why don't you tell us the basic setup for? Well, Theft it starts of an Idol. in the theater, and um, there's this very much vaunted um, production. That is, it's a very controversial production. Um, again, there's not a lot written about the theater in Alexandria at that time, so I can just make shit up, which I am doing. Yeah, but we and went to <laughs> see. We actually went to see the mm -hmm. rooms of the theater yes, in Yes, but there was also the, this is the Odeon. That's a little amphitheater that we went to see. This is the Odeon. The Odeon actually did exist. It was a great, big, it was a 2,500-seat theater. It was based on, I forget, one in Greece. It was covered. It was covered, yeah. And um, so it's a big deal, and a lot of Alexander is going to be there, including the Queen. So they wait, and 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 the production doesn't start. And finally, the manager comes out in fear and in trembling because the Queen you know, of Alexandria in Egypt is sitting right there saying, well, we're sorry, but the lead role is going to have to be played by this other actors. And there's almost a riot, but Cleopatra gets up, and she stops it. And then the production goes forward, and it's okay. And then at the end of it, as they, everybody's leaving and there's a big commotion and nobody's paying, paying any attention, Cleopatra leans over to Teta Sherry and says, find Herminia, my eye, find her, and find her now. And the, the and Teta Sherry doesn't know anything about why Cleopatra would be interested in Herminia or what their relationship is or was, um, and really. So she has to start from the beginning, and she goes to... Um, the very first thing she does, I think, is go to, I can't remember, is it to her house or to Teddy Sherry's work and talks to the people that she works with and just everything progresses from there. And um, the last person to see Herminia has been murdered. That's what she eventually discovers. And So where did they travel in this book? They, they, they go to Alexandria, they go to Memphis, which is the old pharaonic capital of um, uh, Egypt. And it's deteriorating. And I have no knowledge of whether it was or not at that time, but I'm pretty sure it was because everything that was happening was in Alexandria. So, and people are leaving. And then they have to go back to Alexandria. And then they have to go to Syene, which I'm definitely going to be setting a book there in those environs at some point, because Syene is where Aswan is today. And at that time, it was on the frontier between Egypt and um, uh, Nubia. Nubia. And the, the, they, the um, Romans garrisoned um, uh, troops there, um, at least a legion, at least one legion. And Elephantine, the island in the middle of the, the river, is where the town on both sides would empty out when Nubian warlords would come over the hill and attack the place. Right, but it's also the site of the first cataract, so the Nile becomes unnavigable once you get down there. And, um, it's and a, a port. Yeah, um, and, and Egyptian gold, which they used in tremendous amounts, as you know, from King Tut's funerary stuff and all, it comes from Nubia. There's, it's not, there's not gold in Egypt. It's down further south. The granite from all the, uh, all the tombs that you see and the columns that you see are from Aswan, and we actually got to go see the last one that they were working on. It's still laying there. And then we found out that a whole bunch, they, there are instances in the records of um, they'd build these columns and they'd put them on boats and ship them down the Nile. A lot of them rolled off. So at the bottom of the Nile, there's a bunch of yeah. columns. <laughs> obelisk, actually. You know, the carved yeah. obelisk. And the one that's still in Aswan that you can go and visit is there because it cracked. You know, it's this enormous, but it, it cracked. So it's fascinating to go and see. They tell you about how it all worked and so forth. But they claim that there are probably quite a few carved obelisks and so forth. You know, Cleopatra's Needle in uh, London. and Is that where it's it in London? I'm trying to remember. Anyway, there are several, several, yeah, there are several obelisks that, um, so there's the whole history of European colonialism um, involved in, in, Egyptology and um, archaeology, and now they're making a big effort to bring Egyptians forward. Like you, say, as you said in Bernanke, you know it's Egyptians that are are digging. Well, I mean, the you know the <laughs> they've rebuilt Hatshepsut's tomb, and it was the Poles that did it. the The Polish um, archaeological organization has a tremendous presence, at least in the Valley of the Kings. There, that I found that was really interesting too. Right. Well, the University of Chicago did, you know, the British did. I mean, they're, they're mo most of what we know about Egypt right now is a product of 
other cultures going into Egypt and digging it all up. Um, but now the Egyptians are making it. There's a really interesting book. I, I wrote a whole section in the November Book News about books about Egypt and all. And one of them, this woman um, starts out as an Egyptologist, and then she goes to Oxford, and she takes a look at um, at colonialism in archaeology. Now she's teaching in Durham. She's from Ohio, so I quite know how this all worked out. But she's talking about um, the hist what we know is filtered through um, Western Euro Euro European and American perceptions and all, and it's interesting to see how it's going to change maybe with Egyptians looking at their own history. But they didn't have the training, they didn't have the education, you know, at the time that all this went on. But there were a whole bunch of, like, private fiefdoms. In fact, um, on Crete, the palace of King Mino, I'm trying to remember the name. Do you remember, Don? What's the name of the dig? Sorry? Yes, thank you. Canassus. Actually, a guy bought the whole thing. It was, there was this great big kind of um, mound on Crete, and I'm trying to remember his name. Um, anyway, he decided he wanted to dig it up, so he just bought it from the Cretan government, and then he excavated it, and then he recreated what he thought a lot of it should look like. So if you go visit it, what, what you see is his imagined... Uh, I mean, some of the, it's sort of like Pompeii, you know, some of it's the real deal, but some of it's been reconstructed entirely as, you know, he sort of envisioned what it might look like. And that was true in Egypt. They would actually go and they would, you know, like buy from the government um, areas to dig up. I mean, have you read the Amelia Peabody series by Elizabeth Peters? Well, you know, they were always having this battle about who got to dig where. And, you know, so... It's it's you know it's, it's not a really coherent story in lots of respects. Um, so it, you know in a way, Dana, if they do find anything about Cleopatra, I'd like to think it will be under Egyptian auspices, oh, and then absolutely. maybe we'll have a much more coherent narrative. It would be great. I'd be like to see um, who's our who was our guide in Luxor. I'd like to see him heading it up. That'd be interesting. He was terrific. He's, he was I a, hope he survived he the pandemic because he was wonderful. But his entire job depended on tourists. You know that whole economy was so um, tourist dependent, and I'm hoping that many of them were able to keep their jobs and you know will survive so that you can go back. So Death of an Eye was the first book, um, and that's the one where um, Ted to Sherry is invited to become she's the in, Well, she's investigating the death. She's uh, Her friend, Cleopatra, not yet her boss, her friend, Cleopatra, invites her to, asks her, please, to find out who killed the current holder of the eye. And then who was found dead on the street in Alexandria. The, oops, sorry. Disappearance of the Scribe, the second book, I've described it basically as on the waterfront <laughs> in Alexandria because it's really, um, a lot of it takes place on the docks and in the shipping trade in you know, I can sort of see Marlon Brando and, you know, whatever it all is doing that. Um, but also a bit of it was inspired by Dana's fascination with the Library of Alexandria. And well, and also cement. Let's not forget, for, let's forget that they, got, they had better cement back then than we do today. More um, environmentally friendly, too, as well. That was a surprise. Yeah. Actually, I remember editing a book years ago about, I can't remember what civilization it was, and I, I came across cement, and I thought, now that's one of those modern words, and this is, you know, an anachronism here, and all. I looked it up. God, the history of cement is like as old as people. Vitruvius, um, the, 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 um, in, who was first introduced in um, uh, Disappearance of a Scribe, and he has a walk-on in um, Theft of an Idol. He's the Roman engineer that came with uh, Caesar's um, engineers, and um, uh, worked on ballistae and, you know, mangonels and whatever you call them at that time, siege engines. And I ca and it also, again, I don't know in the record, I don't know if it's not in the record whether he actually stayed, but I can't imagine a guy like that um, who eventually wrote a book on architecture would not have hung around Alexandria for a while just so he could plumb the depths of the Library of Alexandria, which at that time was 300 years in the making and, you know, had all the texts. So it was really fun to write him into the story. God, I got a huge bang out of that. But one of the things that I found really interesting was that the at that time, they knew the difference between the good cement, which they could use on the waterfronts, and the bad, the crap cement that they could use everywhere else. And that's what dis, uh, Disappearance of a Scribe, that's what it, um, the whole premise of the book 
resides on. Corruption in the building trade. What a surprise. Wow. Yeah. I know. yeah. What, what do you know? It's still happening. It was happening then. <laughs> Very true. Although, you know, the Romans really built to last. I mean, you only have to go to Rome and go to the Pantheon to be really stunned by, you know, how successful. And their road building, I mean, you can still see roads stretching across England, for example, that are Roman roads. I was looking at something the other day where I, somebody was going to Scotland and they were actually going up the old Roman road, which is now... I think the M5 I have kind hiked. of parallels. I it. have hiked on an old Roman road in yeah. Scotland. Yes, I have. Or, well, in England. Anyway, northern England. Sort of like Route 66. You know, <laughs> you want to go up there to the mother road where it's now Interstate 40, but there's still bits of that left. Anyway, so tombs and, you know, other stuff come into play. And Dana and I did on-the-spot research, as we've mentioned to you, uh, at the pyramids and at Saqqara. And then um, a couple, the step pyramid, and I'm trying to remember, there was a different, which is the one we, we climbed into. Do you um, remember? Um, yeah, no. Um, uh, there were a lot of them. <laughs> I want to say Bashar, Bashar. Uh, the Shard Sh Pyramid? No, uh, no? Saqqara, Saqqara. We were at Saqqara, but it was the Red Pyramid. Oh, it's the Red Dashar. Pyramid. Dashar. 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 Okay, yeah, right. Yes. Um, so anyway, um, we were the only people there. We were alone inside that thing. I mean, you know, what could go wrong? <laughs> Four thousand year old pile of rocks in earthquake country. Yeah, I wasn't nervous. But you have to climb on a very rickety stairway. You have to climb way up high because the entrance to the pyramid is not at ground level uh, for a lot of reasons. So it was fine to climb up. Um, and then you have to descend on this ghastly little um and then it wasn't that bad to climb out. For me, the hardest part of it was that I I was having trouble with my leg. I couldn't balance well enough to walk down that incredibly steep outside care staircase. And the little guide, he's the only one there. He had nobody else to look after him. He was so sweet. He went over and got in front of me, and he acted like a, you know, a, a you know, a movable cane. He walked me all the way down so I could hold on to his shoulders so I could climb down there. And I'll I'll look at it. I'll show you the photo. It's on my. Well, actually, I did. I mailed it to you. Remember that rickety thing going up? That's the one you had to come back down. So Dana, of course, was snickering over on the sideline. Well, <laughs> I was not snickering. <laughs> right. Anyway, it was a it was a real adventure. So I was so glad to be out in the sun and the air again when we got out of that thing. <laughs> yeah, but I think it was I think for the purposes of your you know adding authenticity. Oh to yeah, writing, I mean that a scene. There's a do. scene in the book in the tomb in the book. There they've been they've been um, abandoned, locked. I don't know what you would call it. In a they have been. Um, locked up in a tomb and left to die. And I'll tell you, that scene is written from the heart. Yes, indeed. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> and we spent time in Luxor, which is basically built over what was called Thebes, which was a major um, Egyptian city. And once again, it's sort of like London. Wherever you dig, you're going to find stuff underneath it. Um, and it'll be interesting to see, you know, over time what they, because Thebes was a major city. And like, who knows what's down there? You know, that they will eventually... LiDAR is an amazing technique. Are you all familiar with LiDAR? It's a ground-penetrating radar. And um, that's how that Doug Preston found the Lost City, or was in that group that found the Lost City, the Monkey God. And they were able to use LiDAR by flying over the deep forest in wherever it is, somewhere in Central America. And by using LiDAR, they could see that there were buildings under this incredible canopy of trees. And eventually they went and excavated it. One of the really interesting things that I, I, you know, I mean, I could, if somebody would pay me just to do the research, I'd probably never write another word. But um, one of the things that I ran across is that, of course, the Nile River is a living thing and it changes, it changes in its roots, to, in, in its root, as um, uh, you would expect it to do when the weather changes. You know, there are droughts, there are um, um, wet seasons, there are, you know, wet centuries. And the, the river, so the river changed at Memphis, between Memphis and the pyramids. So you can actually see now, at least in some part, where the ancient Egyptians engineers um, built docks to where when the river, the, the river was close enough to where they could unload to take all those granite blocks up to the Giza Plateau. I, it just and then I and I have found references that people will say that Memphis is on one side of the river or it's on the other side of the, on the other side of the river, but the river was what moved. I thought that was uh, yeah, it's just I mean I don't know why I should think that's cool. It's just nature, but it's it's a great it is just a great little 
it's just a great little tidbit of information. I hope that the dam in Ethiopia plus the dam in Aspen are not going to change the Nile to the point where, you know, I think it's an extremely difficult subject. That is a war waiting to happen. Well, not enough water um, and water resources. I mean, I don't and think... Look what's happening here. Yep. I know. We're actually been cut further by the Colorado... We're getting less of the Colorado River compact. So I want to go over to California and really push them into desalination because they're the only people who can really do that and take less water out of the Colorado. But, you know, Dana was saying there's something like 400 people a day moving to Phoenix, to this area, and I think, where do they think the water's going to come from? At some point, it's going to be, you know, virtually impossible. So some of the problems that um, that people faced long ago were facing, again, with climate change, water change, the whole bit. Um, you know, maybe there'll be an asteroid. <laughs> Who knew? I don't think the dinosaurs thought they'd be extinct. I think we figured out the asteroid thing, though, here mm -hmm. recently. <laughs> right. So how about questions? Because I think we've ranged all around. We don't want to tell you very much more about the book because we'll spoil the story. Yeah, I know. I never talk very much about the book. It drives no. you nuts. I know. Sorry. Okay. I think you know, I wanted to talk about the whole series because the good news is if you're only three books in, it's easy for people to start at the beginning and catch up. You know, it's different than if you show up at book 13 and it's kind I of daunting. When I was signing books in the back, Patrick had a, a whole set, right? The paperback and then the hardcover of Disappearance and then the hardcover of this one. And it just did my heart good. Nobody's ever going to do that for the K2 Gag novels, <laughs> ever. I mean, the next one's the 23rd one. There's nobody who can ever buy, you know, all of those books all at once, even if they were all still, you know, in print, which most of them aren't. Yes. When you learned about the continents that they did back then, that was one of the sort of ideas for you in Death of the Sky uh, for that story. So is there any particular inspiration for uh, what you evolved in that book? Um, inspiration for a theft of an idol? Um, Actually, it was the statuary and the realization that the statuary... I saw... I, I have a book that has um, the, the, the statuary as we see it today, which is white. You know, that's you, you look at the Colosseum and it's white. And you look at statuary and museums, old Greek statues, and they're white. But they weren't. They were painted and gilded. They were brightly colored. They were almost blindingly, you know. This is, and um, I saw this one statue. And the, the, in the illustration, it was a statue of um, the uh, um, Thespis, the drama, the goddess of drama. And... I, everything just happened from there. Everything, and I thought, okay, an act. And also, I had seeded it in Disappearance of a Scribe. I had seeded what happened in this book because there is a scene in Disappearance of a Scribe when they're all in the kitchen at Uncle Neb's house and talking about how there's going to be a play the next month and could Uncle Neb get him tickets. So <laughs> I kind of knew what was coming, yeah. And then I, that's how I began this book, yeah. 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 I'm, the question is, how much time do I spend researching and how much time I spend writing? Well, as a matter of fact, um, right now what I'm doing is researching and outlining the next four books in this series. Yeah, Isis 4, 5, 6, and 7. Those are what I'm going to be doing next. And what the uh, way I am started out is um, because everybody wrote about Caesar and very few people wrote about Cleopatra and whatever that was written about Cleopatra was suppressed or, you know, um, just turning her into the bad guy. Um, then the the what I'm doing is taking the timeline of Julius Caesar's life because there that is known. There's actual dates and years mostly that I can use. So I'm setting up what is, and I found a lot of really interesting stuff with gaps in the narrative, which suits my purposes very well. And um, the Kate Chugak series, for example, um, they they happen about they on average, happen about once every three months and three or four months in Kate's life. Um, on average, that's not like... So this um, series as well is happening like um, the first book, Death of an Eye, happened, the the death of Kemet was in May of the year that Julius Caesar was in Egypt. 
and then it ends in September. The next book is in October. This or this book is in October. Excuse me. The next book is in September. This book is in October, and then the Julius Caesar goes to Africa to put down a to a rebellion of um, an uh, Pompeian who has a guy who followed Pompey, who was Jesus. Julius Caesar was battling against him before. Cleopatra's brother assassinated him and handed his head to Caesar, literally. Um, and so Caesar's going to go and, you know, clean out these Pompeians so that he doesn't have to worry about them breathing down his neck. Well, this Pompeian, um, Metallicus Scipio, has hooked up with Juba I, who is the king of um, Numidia. And um, so he Caesar goes off to... Africa, he lands on, I think it's, he leaves on December 25th, he leaves Sicily on December 25th, he gets there on December 28th, but there's a lot of screwing around and the Battle of Thapsus doesn't happen until April. Really? And then, <laughs> so I got lots of months to play with there, and there is, there are some, as there always seem to be at this time, incredible shenanigans of people defecting and bribing, you know, he's, the first thing Caesar does is bribe people to come over to his side, and in the meantime, people always want to fight for Caesar and nobody else, so people are defecting to his side, and, and also in the meantime, King Juba of uh, Numidia has a beef with King Bacchus of Mauritania, and Mauritania wants Jupiter to lose no matter what side he's on. And I, so, I mean, there's just lots of machinations. So I think that's going to keep Teta Sherry pretty busy for, I'd say, the next four to six months. <laughs> so, I mean, you asked that question. I'm sorry, I answered it. <laughs> Living or dead? Dead? Michael Gilbert. Yeah. I, I think he was very well known in England. I don't think he was anywhere near well enough known here in the States or in any, I'm not sure, any other English-speaking um, country. I'm, he's a brilliant writer. I mean, I have his stuff, and I reread it all the time. Some of it, yes. Room Org Press. The um, British Library Crime Classics have done a couple of Michael Gilbert's. Michael Gilbert lived into his 90s, and he was a solicitor that lived in Sussex, and he rode the train into London to his chambers, and he wrote on the train. He wrote on the train. Yeah. I mean, he wrote on the train. Mm -hmm. and he had a day job, and then he wrote on the train going to and from his day job. I mean... <laughs> Well, some people are watching Instagram or, you know, whatever it is. Michael Gilbert was actually writing. so And he wrote well on the train. Living? Um, I don't know. You know what? I would need some time in this store looking at all the books to give you an answer. Sorry, John. I don't want to. Yeah, I don't. So many. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean there's so many. There, uh, God. <laughs> You know, there are the New York Times bestsellers, and then there's the rest of us. And there, in, among the rest of us are many, many underappreciated writers. Robert I'm sorry, Pope I didn't mean is, to include myself in that number. No, Robert <laughs> Pope is an interesting example. You know, we love him, City of Windows and the other two books, and yet um, the series didn't do well enough for his publisher to continue it. And, you know, he's one of our best-selling Everybody on staff, you know, well, not everybody, but some people on staff really like his works. Um, you know, it, I, how can you explain Colleen Hoover? I am totally unable to explain the phenomenon that is Colleen Hoover, who is like, what, seven books on the bestseller list at the moment, and everybody's streaming in here to buy them, and now she's, co she's collaborating with Taryn Fisher to do some kind of romance thing and all. I mean, it's just like a freight train, you know, going on and on. But what Yeah. Fifty Shades of Grey would be an excellent, yeah, example. Um, I don't, I, you know, I, we were talking about that a week or two ago, and we've concluded that phenomenons like that really are bought by people who are not regular readers. You know, it's like the person who reads one or two books a year, and they think, oh, wow, this looks really great, you know, or I should read this because it's so hot. And so the numbers are completely distorted. I think. Um, I'm going to write a blog post just for you on underappreciated. I don't know if I'll, it'll be underappreciated writers, but it'll be underappreciated books. 
I will. I'll send you a link, John. And I will thank you at the top of the post for the inspiration. I know. It, um, I, I was at a conference in Indiana last weekend, Indianapolis, a very small conference, but the bookseller there was very sharp, and we had uh, a talk, and she said that um, that she was selling a ton of backlists, that people were interested in you know, older books. And I don't know that we do as good a job as I wish we did about backlist, you know, books, not current books, but um, older books. You're not given a lot of help. I mean, you know, this is a store that sells print books, and there's probably a whole bunch of books you'd like to sell that are no longer in print. Well, that's part of the problem. And the other thing is that the prices for um, paper bags, you know, they've gone up to like eighteen ninety nine or something, and hardcovers. The, the, we've had the sharpest increase in book prices for years all of a sudden due to the paper shortages and the supply chain thing and all the rest of it. So I don't know. You know, if I were... That's a lot of money to invest in a in an older book. I'm glad that the British Library Crime Classics have held the line. They're still fourteen ninety five, I think. And there are some, you know, like twelve ninety five, but I think eighteen ninety nine is a big investment, you know, to be making in an older book. So I'm not sure how that will handicap backlist. And then as Dana says, unfortunately, because it's her own experience, you know, a lot of publishers don't keep backlist in print, or if they do, they use something called um, print-on-demand, and they jack up the price. When Stephen Saylor was here, because his Ancient Roman series is one of my very favorites, I went to order some of his earlier books. They were twenty eight ninety nine each for a print-on-demand paper pack, and I said to the publisher, you know, what are you doing? Why wouldn't you? Because there's no money involved in print-on-demand, you know? I mean, why, and, and I realized afterward that the answer is that they just want to keep the ebook rights. And so, you know, they're not really interested in selling the paper bags. So I don't, I don't really understand that kind of thought process at all. I would lower the price for the print on demand books and encourage people to read the backlist. I, you know, makes no sense to me. But we have to work with what we can get since we don't have an actual printing press here in the store. And there, there actually is this, a thing. I don't know if it's still available, but somebody made um, a kind of giant, like fax machine, or you know, no Xerox machine, copy machine, where I'm trying. What do you remember what it's called? It has an actual name, but anyway, you could come in here and you could decide you wanted a book, and then you could program you the machine. You mean like a three D print printer? Um, yeah, but with books, and it has a, a name. And some bookstores did actually, they're very expensive, uh, did actually buy them. But you'd be limited to what um, was programmed for the machine to do. It isn't like you could just call up any book, you know. So I think, um, and then there'd be all kinds of copyright and royalty issues and the whole bit. So I never... The invested. writer must be paid. Yep. Let's not I forget. I never invested in it because I just thought that it, it, you know, the chances were poor that it would ever pay for itself, plus it takes up a lot of room and the whole bit. Um, so, you know, unfortunately, um, digital books, well, you know, they've done very well for you, but from our standpoint, digital books are really the best answer to um, how to make older books available. So we're stuck with them. Patrick, were there any questions? He mentioned the street pictures. Oh. <laughs> no. <laughs> there's a uh, there's a question from a viewer online about the street urchins. Um, yes, I love them. The the order of the owl. <laughs> yeah, they uh, help. They uh, Ted Sherry is kidnapped and probably would very likely have been murdered. Um, and they rescue her in the second book. And so she decides, okay, she's going to hire them all. And she they've got a space to um, put them in at uh, Uncle Neb's house. And they are now pages to House Neb Nebentero. And her second string investigating group. <laughs> a little nod to Sherlock Holmes here, right? Baker, Baker Street Irregulars, only these are the Canopic Way Irregulars. <laughs> yeah. oh, they're a lot of fun. Well, thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you, virtual audience. Um, if you'd like to visit with Dana or get your book signed at all, please do. And otherwise, have a wonderful evening. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, guys. Thank you.